Vamos a ver los premios que se han tenido en los chicos que es el gobierno de la República. O sea, el premio de la República que es un diploma. Entonces, yo creo que para eso debía subir esto. Si no lo damos un momentito, nos lo vemos. O sea, hay un premio de la República que es un diploma de la República. Pero si nosotros no sabemos, no lo damos. Tenemos el premio Sáenz de Vichar, el premio de la Sáenz y el premio de la Sáenz de la Sáenz. Fue la Cátedra Blanca. La Cátedra Blanca. Entonces, si te parece, empezamos dando los premios para que suba a Javier Fuertes. Javier Fuertes. Javier Fuertes, que es de San Antonio. Es el responsable de Javier Fuertes. Está a Mundela Lomillo, que es ella, Javier Fuertes. ¿Se lo va a subir ella también? No, yo creo que estamos los tres. Entonces, lo único que tenemos que hacer es firmar estos momentos. ¿Cómo le quito un número? ¿Cómo le quito un número?
Hola. Sí. Ay. Hola, buenos días a todos. Me acompañan hoy Javier Fuertes, director de Cemento Blanco de Cemex, y Ignacio Vicens, catedrático del Departamento de Proyectos de la Escuela y director de la Cátedra Blanca. Eh, como sabéis, la Cátedra Blanca está haciendo un servicio maravilloso a la escuela, trayendo eh, un montón de conferenciantes y haciendo distintos tipos de actividades y de premios, contribuyendo al entendimiento de que arquitectura sin construcción no tiene nada, no existe, son solamente meros dibujos y que la arquitectura buena es la arquitectura que además se ha construido bien, que es lo que se supone que sabemos hacer en esta escuela. Eh, la Cátedra Blanca está eh, concentrada en la construcción de cemento y va trayendo eh, a los grandes especialistas del panorama internacional. Esta vez, y luego eh, Nacho hará la presentación de Piet Ecker, eh, para mí es muy, voy a decir, divertido, porque es la segunda vez que presento a Piet Ecker en, en una semana. El miércoles pasado eh, formó parte de eh, otra eh, invitación, también del, esta vez del Departamento de Proyectos, del ciclo del Dual Practice, en el que eh, Piet nos hablaba de la relación entre eh, la práctica profesional y la enseñanza que es algo que en esta escuela consideramos eh, muy importante. No por... Del director abajo, todos eh, trabajamos y creemos que hay que estar metidos en el mundo del trabajo y en el mercado profesional para poder enseñar de una manera mejor eh, lo que es eh, arquitectura. Y esta escuela siempre se ha vanagloriado de tener grandes arquitectos entre su profesorado y esperemos que eso eh, siga así. Eh, welcome again, Pete. It's a pleasure to have you again in one week. <risa> eh, vamos a intentar inclusive este modelo de que se den dos conferencias distintas. Pete el otro día eh, se centró fundamentalmente en su relación entre práctica y enseñanza y cómo eso interviene en los trabajos de sus estudiantes y hoy va a contarnos eh, cómo, a, cómo construye, cómo eh, trabaja eh, con hormigón, cómo trabaja con cemento y cómo esa eh, forma de construir interviene en su proceso de diseño. Antes de que demos paso a su conferencia, eh, Javier y Nacho eh, van a entregar eh, a los estudiantes el premio Sáenz de Oiza. Sabéis que la cátedra tiene tres premios, creo que son Sáenz de Oiza, De la Sota y Canolaso. Eh, y, eh, y, y Javier Carvajal, perdón, tiene cuatro premios. Eh, estamos además en el centenario de Oiza, así que eh, vamos a proceder a la entrega de los premios a los estudiantes y le paso a Nacho el micrófono para que eh, se ocupe. Bueno, rapidísimo porque todos lo que queremos es escuchar a Pit y, eh, y tengo que decir que mi, mi presentación va a ser exactamente en, en dos palabras. Pero sí que eh, siempre en la primera conferencia que organiza la Cátedra Blanca solemos entregar los diplomas a los premios, eh, eh, digo bien los diplomas, porque el talón con la pasta se entrega inmediatamente después de darlo, que es lo que realmente a la gente interesa, pero eso también tiene su interés. Bien, entonces vamos a dar los diplomas a los que han ganado eh, a los dos últimos eh, concursos que se hicieron, que eran la Torre en Naguele y la Pasarela en Hormigón, ¿eh? del, premio Alejandro, eh, del, perdón, del premio Francisco Javier Sadioiza. Entonces, solamente, muy rápidamente, llamamos a la gente para que reciban el, el diploma y así podemos empezar la conferencia. El primer premio del, del concurso 16, concurso Cátedra Blanca Francisco Javier Sadioiza, fue para Óscar Cruz García, Pablo Pardinas Sarce y Gianfranco Pili Betancourt. ¿Están aquí? Gracias.
Y el primer premio para de la pasarela es para ser... Tercer premio, Sara Sánchez Molina. Accesit primero, eh, de Naguele, Jorge Gordón Fernández, Ana Fernández Lázaro y Andrea Roldán Moedano. Y segundo de pasarela para Borja Bielsa Beibel, Beatriz Pablo Romero Rein y Rocío Caldés Sánchez. Y finalmente el acceso y segundo de Naguele, Ana Fresnillo Poza y Laura González Gutiérrez. Bien, bueno. entonces, nada más decir eh, que... Eh, perdón. Ah, eh, eh, que con eh, el acto de hoy queda, se inaugura el curso de la Catedral Blanca, que continuará mañana también con un jury, que Piet vendrá al, eh, bueno, en, en nuestro taller para tener un jury público, estáis todos invitados también. Y, eh, y el miércoles tendremos el, el comienzo del hormigonado, se hará en el taller experimental eh, materia y espacio el hormigonado de la nada más. Entonces yo creo que como todos estamos deseando que, eh, que Piet eh, empiece con su conferencia y el director ya le presentó magníficamente el otro día, yo creo que lo único que tenemos que decir aquí es que eh, una vez más en la Cátedra Blanca insistimos en esa dualidad que nos interesa tanto en esta escuela de proponer conferenciantes que sepan combinar tanto eh, la especulación teórica y la enseñanza como la construcción real, el fatigoso y el arduo trabajo de hacer realidad todo eso que se piensa. Y, que se, ¿eh? y, es, y Pitt es un ejemplo de todo ello, tiene un taller fantástico, un, un estudio maravilloso, vamos a ver sus obras hoy. Y al mismo tiempo está clase también en Mendricio y en otros sitios, pero básicamente aquí en Mendricio. Y yo creo que es, es un auténtico maestro del hormigón, sabe unir poesía eh, con realidad, el hormigonado con la capacidad de, eh, de, de soñar. Y entonces eh, he dicho que no iba a hablar y estoy hablando, con lo cual quítame directo. La, el teléfono. <risa> Muchas gracias a Javier Fuertes, Demex, y a Ignacio Vicens, eh, entre otras cosas, por mantener el humor en esta escuela que hace tanta falta. Eh, Piedecker. So thank you, Manuel and Ignacio, for this kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here again. Um, could we switch off the light? Is this possible? This as well? Just make it really dark. Very good. Very good. So I, I entitled this lecture Resilient Space uh, because resilience as a condition we're trying to aim for, this is a very important condition or a very important definition for us for uh, the spaces we are uh, conceptualizing and we are uh, building. This is uh, Houdini, and uh, I hope that most of you know who Houdini was. I think it's a fantastic example of an artist that used to 
design a constraint or a difficulty uh, and then uh, the whole virtuosity that is related to his art is to liberate himself from this imposed difficulty. Um, as far as I know, uh, Houdini never died on his experimentations. He died a natural death. So he's been thrown overboard several times uh, with chains like this, so he could not uh, swim, but he was able to liberate himself. Now, this idea about liberation or this idea about finding a recipe or a strategy to deal with the issue of constraint, this was something that came along all my career, uh, and it is, of course, also related to, let's say, the circumstances, the economical, the cultural uh, uh, circumstances of the architecture in Switzerland, which means for many people still is a very comfortable condition, but um, the circumstance has changed quite substantially. That means uh, it is still very difficult to do good architecture and it remains very difficult to do good architecture because so many factors are there and influencing the architectural production that you can say architecture stays a very vulnerable discipline because you're relating to so many people. Now this Houdini uh, is a very interesting uh, uh, view or is a very interesting take on trying to simply work or to dare to work with difficulties. So a small statement in the beginning, our work confronts idealism with an inventory of realities. So we're very idealistic, but we're also very realistic. The confrontation witnesses a sense of irony, a pleasure, and a strategic contradiction to reassess the omnipresent burden of context and program and context and program and context and program. This is like something that never stops. So desire and reality, narrative and analysis form an increasingly conflicted relationship. This is the reality of my generation. I don't get programs, I don't get narratives that, that are coherent anymore. Now E2A's contribution therefore don't necessarily have to adhere to a single vision of cohesion, but rather integrate discrepancies and disruptions with implicit organizational logic. Constraints are converted into architectural form. That's important. Constraints are converted into architectural form. So we search, we analyze, we're trying to understand what is potentially paradoxic, and then we're trying to develop this as a formal aspiration. It's a concept about control and tolerance. And you will see the, the work I show always latently has exactly these two components. You can say where we are very picky as architects, where we are very insisting that this is important to be done. But on the other hand, you have to learn also to loosen up, to let things uh, go. Uh, so it is a kind of a, a, a procedure of a deal that takes place in space. I'm still trying to uh, promote this book, which I have also promoted last Wednesday. So it's called The Silent Forum, and it's basically an inventory exactly on these procedures. It's an inventory exactly on these strategies, uh, how we imagine or how we develop uh, models that are not so much the physical um, impression of the, of the potential result, but much more a representation of exactly this idea, how constraints are translated into form. So it's a kind of a conceptual readability, some pages of it. So the, the way that we basically use uh, and impose this methodology for ourselves. Now this is my hometown, this is Zurich. Zurich has been um, at an exposure of um, a very large um, growth. Uh, it's not normal that cities grow so much. You have to imagine that Zurich has a growth almost between seven to 10% per year. That's enormous, that's enormous for a city, but the city itself is not like Madrid, but it's very compact. It's about 400,000 people. 
And we are in one of the boom town areas. This is this red square which you see, which is called Altstetten, which was a former warehouse district. Um, it is a, let's say, quarter that is uh, the largest uh, circle uh, in the city, uh, but has the least amount of inhabitants. So you can imagine what happens. This is a kind of a, a site of um, uh, intense densification. Now, this is an aerial shot, and this is our site. I have been told to do this with the mouse. I hope you see this. This is the the site which we are, uh, um, have organized the building, but you see also enormous buildings. This is a warehouse and a, a workshop of the tram section. So trams are being rep uh, repaired. This is 500 meters and this is maybe three, uh, two, 280 meters or 300 meters. So it's quite an enormous building. So within this kind of very atypical site of Zurich, this is how it looked like at the time. So it's very kind of dirty, or you can say this is maybe a bit, yeah, it has a kind of a dirty realism. The rest of the, city is, of the city is very polished. You know, the city in Zurich is very clean. You know, it's very designed. So it's, for us, it was a, a real fresh breath of air to work in a circumstance, in a contextual condition like that, where not everything is already preconceived as a design or as a, as a, as a, a clean and uh, pretty context. So you see these kind of impressions, very robust buildings, very tough ones. <clears throat> and then this. This was the diagram which we have uh, uh, lined up uh, with our client. And the client was a diaconry. It's very rare. Uh, a diaconry basically um, uh, that worked for more than 150 years in Zurich. Uh, one of the main uh, works they do is they are uh, into healthcare, so it's a basically a care organization for healthcare. Now the program was very complex. You can say they wanted to uh, organize uh, in a new building their own new headquarters, so their administrative center. They wanted to develop a palliative care. You know, palliative care, this is a care where people are being cared of before they die. Um, and they wanted to combine this concept of a palliative care with a business hotel, which was a very, let's say, provocative combination. They wanted to combine it with a daycare with kids, with more than 80 kids, with conference facilities. There is a medical uh, service uh, center in it, um, and uh, there's a public restaurant in it. So you can say, in the beginning, it, it started very specifically, the program, and then it got more and more and more. And what is interesting, by just adding more and more program, is that program gets less and less important. It has no meaning anymore in the sense because it can be anything. It can be anything in the terms of it can change. Uh, it, it, let's say it has a certain volatility in it. So how do you design a building? How do you make a building where you realize through the enormous mixed use quality of the building that you have no relevant program in hand? So you cannot base your architecture on a program, but you have to base it on something else. And this is the concept that uh, we have uh, evolved. Uh, it is uh, one of those uh, white models, uh, and it's a kind of a very much gritted building. It's a kind of a very rigid building, you can say. And we made a very rigid building because we thought anything inside could actually be organized. So um, uh, it is uh, an architecture that is not necessarily anymore relating to program, but uh, place it quite openly as, an, as, a, as a possibility to occupy for any kind of program. So you see that this is the kind of structural regime. It's a load-bearing facade with cores, and if you see it from the uh, thin side, the proposed concept was a high-rise building, 40 meters high and maybe 12 meters wide and uh, 85 meters long. And you see it had a kind of an eccentric core line, so you see like off-gritted, off in the, in, the, in the second half to the right is the kind of alignment of the core. 
And what is interesting is that with this very robust sense of idea of an architecture, the, the volume uh, basically got together in a kind of a very, uh, in a site that was more, more maybe described as a, as a backyard area. You see that uh, this, this is one of the kind of largest UBS back offices. These are all these warehouses. And it was just this kind of very slim, slender slab building that we placed in there uh, to hold this uh, program. I really like this montage. This was a very early montage, which basically shows how the building sits very calmly in a kind of a, uh, a very diversified uh, silhouette in the urban context. So it basically has a kind of a st almost stoic quality very, very uh, calm. And now what is interesting, this was the kind of idealistic approach, and this is the realistic image of it. So you see how the two images got very close to each other. So within, working within the silhouette with this kind of very thin slab, and you see looking out of the niche, you almost have the same perspective. Now you see this, the rigorosity of the project, the very uh, uh, high degree of repetition uh, in order to say uh, that uh, now the platform is open for exploitation in any direction. And this was the project at the beginning. It was an architecture that was really about the facade and really about the core. An architecture that really could uh, reframe from any columns, from any secondary load-bearing concepts in order, in order to be able to really fill these spaces in between in any direction. So whether this is now a care center, whether this becomes an office, whether this becomes a business hotel, uh, it had no structural, no programmatic relevance for this almost... Um, uh, uh, typological behavior of facade and core. And this was the project at the beginning, so it is um, a fully uh, building in concrete with a um, uh, concrete facade with, of course, the concrete uh, cores and the ceilings and the floors. This was the kind of the raw impression about the building before uh, the build-ins and the, the different program actually uh, got organized uh, on site. And if you look at this now, this was a kind of a rather a test at the beginning for us how you could actually explore it, how you could actually uh, organize it. Now, this is the case of an office. This is the case of a palliative care. So a fundamental different use is just a shift in the interior walls, but you see how sort of robust the, the, the basic architecture remains. And this is the shift into a business hotel. And so uh, what was surprising for us, in the beginning we designed only core and shell, and then the client started to ask whether we could design a hotel, whether we could explicitly design the palliative, the restaurants, etc., etc. in the end. Um, it was quite an enormous project for us because we designed really everything in it so we could almost test this idea about resilience with our own idea about how to uh, make the interiors. And this is just an interesting fact because you will see always the same materials but you will always see a different juxtaposition in it. You see here the concrete layer of the facade and in every use in every usage, on every le uh, level, you see a different relation how the concrete is being used or uh, how scale is being uh, related to, to, uh, to the concrete work. So this was the public restaurant. This was the daycare. You see like all of a sudden the kids sitting into the window, the concrete becomes a t different role. This, becomes the, this was the palliative care, so uh, fundamental different use. Uh, you still see the same systematics of the facade, uh, different interiors, different materials being uh, expressed. This was the, the plan of the palliative care, so it was kind of a, a two-bay room system where you could sleep, where you had a séjour, like a small living, and a kind of a, a special bathroom where three people could help uh, uh, to, to access. So this was the kind of 
uh, uh, the build in. And what is interesting, the concrete was built like that, that concrete never had to do any re refinement. You know? so, so what we designed as concrete stayed as concrete. And what we uh, dedicated or assigned as buildings or interior were exactly that material spanning or working in the space between the concrete. So this was a kind of almost a, a sense of a grammar that would work all the way through the building. So you see how uh, concrete always stays and how basically the built-in uh, furniture, the, uh, uh, the interior actually uh, is being juxtaposed uh, to the robust materials of the concrete. You see, this was the beginning then of the design of the business hotel. The business hotel worked exactly similar. You see the concrete facades here, and you see the core, and then in between the spaces, you, you see how uh, the uh, architecture has been uh, expressed. You see the, the suites are basically with two bay system. It is be basically being exposed with, with the cementary level and with wood, so with very simple, very basic materials being juxtaposed, but in a very simple rule, and it's kind of surprising how, how, how straightforward, so to speak, the interior process could be perceived just uh, in conjunction with the concrete. So you see some impressions about it, uh, uh, how the work of concrete remains very visible floors, ceiling, and walls. This was the smallest business hotel room, uh, just uh, using this gap of the grid as the concept of the sanitary units, and then having just a very small loft-like open space. This is how it looks like. Also here, the same cementary tiles, the, the way the concrete is being exposed. Um, and what is interesting about it, if, if concrete is, uh, remains as, as an exposed material, the interior material itself can refine this relationship. The concrete itself doesn't have to be refined. And that's a very interesting relationship, basically, between what we control and what we really refine in, in the project. This is our own office now. We have built our own office in this building. Um, and you see also this was uh, another possibility uh, of using uh, the same sort of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, concept of the load-bearing facade and the inner core just to do a fundamental different usage in it. This was the conference center. You see the same concrete layer and you see the inside um, uh, built-in layer uh, with wood. Now, the, the, the building has a very simple section, um, and um, you see also the way that the facade is really working as a load-bearing concept, core and facade uh, kind of determine in a very simple way the architectural uh, premises. Now, I also promised to say something about the construction because I think if this is a kind of a um, a startup, or if this is a kind of a, a beginning of uh, a concept, how do you build these densified walls, or how do you build a wall that can really um, be expressed as, as, as the, the preconceived spatial protagonists as concrete? Now, what we have introduced, we have two layers. This is a plan. Uh, we have uh, two layers of concrete. We have an inside concrete layer and we have an outside concrete layer. And in between is a foam glass insulation. And what is interesting about this development is that we used precast elements inside and not outside. Normally in Switzerland you would use precast elements outside. And we used it inside because we could build the building very quickly, like a Lego building. And this is how the frames were produced on site, uh, sorry, uh, uh, in the factory. So this layer which you see here is the layer, the gray layer, you know, and one element basically spans from here to the midsection to here and kind of uh, has all, let's say, the connections uh, uh, prepared on it. And then this is the way they uh, produced it. 
uh, we had we designed like a catalog. You see blue on the right side. You see how these inner structures were being conceived. You know, there were different. There was like a catalog, like from the ground level, had different dimension to the ordinary level. This was the ordinary level, which uh, basically has a kind of a railing and a beam uh, on top of it. And then further up, uh, uh, the beam got bigger, but the railing disappeared. Uh, so we had different concepts or different kind of extents of this inner layer. And uh, so we, had, we, we could control it uh, really easily. Uh, and uh, we marked it and, uh, and gave it free. And this is how the, con the building got constructed. So in a very simple way, you have to imagine you have this array, you have the trucks coming and the whole perimeter, uh, a quarter of a perimeter is built in a day. So that's uh, enormous speed. Uh, and what was interesting is that, uh, especially in the, in the Swiss climate through the winter, we could work with the precast, while in spring through the summer and fall, we could use the outer development. Now, you do use the, the precast elements, of course, you get a refinement which you would never get on site. And this refinement, we wanted to keep. This was very important so that using the concrete, refine it in a way that it was a kind of a finished surface for the end. Uh, so none of the work uh, was planned to be covered or plastered or painted or whatever. So that was the deal with our clients that we uh, use really this kind of um, uh, resilient expression of architecture, but we do it so sharply and so precisely that uh, we would not need any refinement in it. This was a foam work drawing. I'm also showing the work of the engineer because you cannot design an architecture without your uh, civil engineer that also has a kind of a very important part of it uh, in the sense, uh, the way uh, the, the, um, the concrete has been or is, is being perceived or developed. This, you see here, this is the foam work and the outer foam work, where is my cursor here? The outer foam work had the form of a Swiss cross. So of course the client liked that a lot. And the fact is, there is never a seam where a grid meets, but the seam is always in between. This was the reason to do that, so we could work uh, with, uh, a, with two foam works and uh, developing that outer grid. And you see that this is exactly now the green layer I'm talking about. And while the inside layer was, was precasted, the outside layer was in situ. Yeah? And this was the difference of the two uh, architectural expressions. So um, the in situ concrete was poured with one layer of foam work only, and the, the, we used a kind of a SCC concrete, so self-contracting con concrete, in order to maintain it. Now you see the packaging, the process here. This is the foam work. Further down here, you see the inside precast element. And then this is the foam work, 25 centimeters insulation, or 20, I can't remember anymore. It's a lot in Switzerland. And then the outer layer, the Swiss cross as a foam work, which you see exactly the way um, the foam work uh, comes together. And this is the cross section, which you see exactly. This is precast, this is the insulated area, and this is the in situ uh, 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 casted SCC concrete. So this, this, the importance basically what we do with craftsmen and so on uh, is basically to do only the core and to do the facade exactly in this material but in a, in a very sort of constant, in a very controlled uh, um, uh, circumstance so that you're able to exactly uh, do this architectural expression and beyond this line uh, you develop a kind of a freedom, a kind of an acceptance, a tolerance, um, because it, it's not being the case that we are going to do or that we will forever uh, design uh, an interior condition. Now with the concrete work, the window comes together. And the window, we had 500 of these big size windows and we used a kind of a, a prototypical uh, a product uh, of a Swiss metal 
uh, workshop. Um, and you see the material was very raw. We used this raw aluminum. Um, so it's not uh, eloxated in that sense, but we wanted to have the expression of the building very raw because the neighborhood has this story or has this, um, has this uh, contextual relationship to industry uh, or, or robust architecture. So that's the reason why we did this. And you see the, uh, the making of the frames. The window is a slider. So it slides, and in Switzerland it's very difficult to do a high-rise building in the slider, uh, because a slider is not a very tight window. You have to imagine the old sliders always had brushes, and so with the brush they made the building tight, uh, and this is no longer accepted in Switzerland with the ecological standards. So we had to imagine a concept that we use a slider, uh, but making it also tight when it's closed. And this was the solution, so this was a window that was linked to electricity and air pressure, and we could open it as a slider 65 centimeters. And why did we do this? Because we wanted to have always the same window, but all the different usages in the building have their own dynamics, have their own momentum, so they could, in a way, subvert this, this very stringent role of, of order of that grid, and you will see an example of it. As the detail, uh, we worked almost a year on the detail, just to imagine, just to make it sure so that no one would sue us and that we would not go to court and that we don't get 20 uh, lawyers in the, in the head. So we really had to be careful with this. And this was the system of this outer slider that got connected to the inner core shell. It had to, connect it, to be connected to the inner because of the climate uh, uh, condition in Switzerland. So the outer would have too much expansions. So the outer a uh, concrete layer works freely and the inner is being connected with and insulated with the window. And you see how the insulation got connected here uh, in, in a very tiled uh, way. You see this also vertically. This was the water system. You know, this, the water, when it comes down from the facade, it prevents that it swaps over. It's being deviated. And you see also quite well the way the window is being connected to the inner load-bearing structure of the inner uh, uh, core, uh, of the inner layer of the facade. And then the outer is connecting quite smoothly to it. So this was the result. So something what, what was originally designed in a very rigid way could be very subverted, very playfully worked together with the, time, with the idea of use. So, so a person in a hotel opens at a different moment a window than a person in an office or at the, at the restaurant or at the daycare. So there was a kind of irritation. We searched a kind of an idea about a strict order and its own sense of irritation in it. This was one of the first images, so looking at the building, um, and you see how all the 500 windows got applied. And it kind of also shows the way that you find the mechanisms of the market. When we calculated the window, the window was extremely expensive, you know, uh, very expensive, because it had a kind of automotive uh, steering in it. So it's like a, like a door of a trolley bus, for example, that also works with air and uh, with electricity, you know, but uh, if you want to make a building and you need to steer an element with air and with electricity, technology gets very expensive. And then we found out that we could make exactly the same window, but fix it without any slider. And it cost 1,600 euros, one of these uh, windows. And the movable cost 20,000. So this was the scissor. This was the edge of the work. So how much fixed glazing do you put in in order to cross-calculate your facade so that your facade is not more expensive than anyone else, than any normal um, facades that uh, there is? And it shows exactly the way uh, I, I was trying to align with this idea of Houdini. So you need a strategy. You need to say how much are you saving on the fixed windows in order to allow a very extraordinary window. And what is very interesting is that uh, you get rid of this 
of these normative cost horizons and you do an architecture that works with very expensive elements and with very cheap elements, you know, and it's just a matter of calculation, how to meet, so to speak, um, uh, the cost target. And this was the impression when the uh, project was finished, so you see like some are open, some are uh, closed. Uh, this has a kind of a very much individual component to it. This was the landscape uh, surrounding the project. Um, and uh, this is from the top view. Uh, you see the facade and the terrace that goes all around uh, of the building, around the building. So, um, and this maybe is a kind of an image that shows well from the initial montage, from the initial idea of the silhouette to design a kind of very calm, stoic building. Um, we really like this image uh, uh, because uh, you've seen all these kind of diversified architectural uh, expressions around it without necessarily saying that this is more important or less important and this we don't want to have on the image and this we want to have on the image. But actually this collage or this clash, this um, relation between uh, the idea of this very, very rigid building that creates a sort of sense of order and sense of a calm moment uh, in a very diversified, heterogeneous circumstance or a contextual uh, condition. That's what we really liked about it. Some other impression, you see the surface. The SSC concrete, of course, delivers a perfect surface. That's why you had to do the foam work in steel, because the, the, the concrete looks like syrup and uh, doesn't work like, a, a, or is not being vibrated in that sense, like a classical application of concrete. And you see how this individual moment uh, is being expressed more in the, in the let's say, uh, response of the user than uh, as an architectural agenda. What I liked about it is that through the loosening of the program that anything could be housed in there, like in the end the house get very diversified and very uh, get got organized with all kinds of different people in it. Uh, so you see an image, uh, you see a business hotel, you see the palliative, you see offices, you see uh, all kinds of functions in it. And what is really interesting, it renders a sense of an architecture that is really based in the city, that really wants to work for the city in the sense of diversifying its users, mixing its users. And this is a kind of a very nice conclusion for us how the, uh, the, the, the project actually turned out. Now I'm showing another project here. This is a project that we have designed for a development company in London. Um, it never got built um, and it was a very strategic project for us because uh, the request was uh, to do a project for a general, co a general contractor. So normally you could say the framework is exactly the opposite of the diaconry. The diaconry is a classic clientele, is a classic person that uh, believes in your skills as an architect and you have a lot of possibilities to design it. You can say if you want to make a good architecture, you really need a good client too. So, but the difficulty is, this was more a subversive con constellation. You couldn't really rate the quality of the clients, and the client said, like, I want to make an architecture with a very early exit. Yeah, so I built something, and then all kinds of people could say what they want in, inside of it, but I don't want to build that, you know? So it's a, as if we would say we built a housing project, but we give the housing project almost in a raw status to the future clients. This was the concept. So what we designed is instead of having the classical relationship of a nucleus and a perimeter column, that basically is the most, uh, let's say, obvious paradigm of making a tower, we um, chopped and uh, uh, um, reduced the core and used only cores and no columns. Uh, so what we have is we have a, an architecture that is being um, uh, combined with a slab and core only. This is the only thing that we have. 
And this was the project, this was the plan. So we worked on the core very explicitly, like every apartment had, of course, a bathroom at the same spot and had a kitchen at the same spot and the kitchen would be finished, the bathroom would be finished, the supply tower would be finished, the exit route would be finished, and in between, nothing would be finished. Yeah. So you could say, I'm trying to do an architecture that is very much defined in the moment about these cores, and it's uh, an architecture that is very much loose or tolerant on the level of what you do on the platform. So you can house, you can move in with a big family, you can move in as a lonely guy, you can move in as a couple, whatever. You know. So there was no kind of preconceived life model that housing normally always embeds. You know, it's like whether this is a block for families or whether the apartments promote that. Vice versa. You see like all kinds of different exploitations of, of it. And, and similar to the project that I have shown, we can say this architecture is not our architecture, but it's actually the one that designs or that makes maybe an interior designer that comes along with the person that buys the platform. And the architecture in the core is the architecture that we design. And the architecture is this, this is our wide model, this is let's say the strategic concept of it, so slab and cores all the cores, of course, on top, all the uses inside on top of each other. Although the project has a kind of nightmarish component that you imagine it's a 100 meter tower and you would have so and so many clients that uh, do their interior job, you just don't want to touch that project. Uh, but it is very straight and it's very economic uh, on its uh, premises, on its idea of how to really do it. And this is how we imagined uh, the spaces because uh, what was interesting is by not refining further the interior, we would save money. And this would be a kind of a very interesting way also to promote architecture that is actually cheap. 40% off market price in London would mean because it, there is no refinement inside, there is no cladding inside, etc., etc. And this is the possibility to live in this semi-raw condition, a kind of an expression and Im imagined the way we proposed it to the general contractor, but of course you can make a wooden decking or you can have terracotta or whatever you want. And this is the way that, of course, these diversified models of life can, can be stacked up, up to 100 meters, and on every level there is something else going on. And uh, it's a kind of a very interesting, maybe, uh, uh, discussion of how you still can make an architecture by being very precise on, on the definitions, but very tolerant on, let's say, the spaces in between. And this was the expression to the outside, so a lifted foot with collective level uh, and collective facilities on the ground, and then the stacking of the uh, different housing units uh, on top of it. So facades and so on, everything will be described, and just the interior uh, is being left to others as a strategic, flexible model for life. You see, if you talk about concrete, the concrete expression of space, you will always talk about also the relevance about structure. You cannot really get rid of this. And I think this project uh, shows it quite uh, well, this dependency. This is Basel, a part of Basel, and Basel is also very much under pressure at the moment. And this uh, great triangle here, or the, it's called the Dreispitz, uh, this was a kind of originally the big supply uh, zone of Basel. So uh, all the food and all the equipment uh, uh, was stored and distributed through these means. Now, everything that uh, doesn't have place, uh, doesn't have a site in Basel, gets nowadays placed in the Dreispitz. And we have recently, or recently a year ago, we won this project, which is the new business university uh, of Basel, and, and the idea was basically to build really a university in the middle of the industrial section here. This, this is the site. And w our proposition from the beginning was to kind of work in a very almost industrial expression of the space, so to have certain affinities 
to the neighborhood, but on the other hand also to come up with a solution that the building institutions in Switzerland, in Switzerland that are very much now cutting down their, their um, budgets uh, for, for buildings, that, that we could propose an idea of a cheap or cheap relatively cheap university building that could be built in one and a half years. And this was the implementation model. So you see the, there's, there's some small spaces left and there was a kind of a, a zoning law where we had to set back the building. Uh, what was very interesting is that the building has a kind of a, quite an enormous width down below and it gets very slender further up. This is what you see here at the model uh, builder. So all the auditoriums and the meetings are uh, organized in the FAT section and then all the professors, the meeting rooms, uh, their individual offices are further up in the, in, the, in the slim section. So it was almost a kind of a self-explanatory display of program. And this is the concept basically. And what we used is we used an expression of two cores this was already quite performative because with, with exit strategies and so on, the building has a length of 140 meters. We used two cores and those two cores are designed in, in concrete in situ. Yeah? So here the concrete is being really plastic, is really done in a very sculptural way and it's being encountered by a very serial idea about uh, this uh, section in between. So, it's a similar uh, contribution or a similar uh, d discourse of what we used to do earlier, but never in that sense of uh, extent of the building. So you see this is the concrete core in C2 designed here, and then in between the large spans that will be very serial, very prefabricated, very fast in between. This was the expression of the building um, um, from the outside. So you see it has this kind of, almost a kind of a factory-like building that has uh, long spans, open windows, um, and kind of uh, works well in this kind of rough, uh, uh, um, in this rough context. And this was uh, um, the architecture of uh, the, make, the making of the architecture in situ. You see like this is all the groundwork that is then related to a very complex core system. Um, and then this is being encountered by an architecture that is super serial, super uh, uh, fast, in a very repetitive uh, uh, way. And of course, at one point it comes together. And the question that is very interesting is what's the virtue of the architecture that is being designed in situ? And what's the virtue of the architecture that has this kind of very serial expression of it? And this was uh, the design of the, the in situ. So there's the main staircase of the building. It's a kind of very sculptural moment where you connect the entire building where also some of the kind of institutional representations are taking place in the building um, for, for connecting vertically um, all the students, uh, let's say, with, with their destinations. And this was the expression of the very serial architecture that's just happening next to it. And maybe this is another view exactly. So, so here you see this kind of fast, almost uh, um, factory-like uh, expression of the architecture that is being extremely encountered by a different mode of architectural expression. And that's what we kind of liked. You can say that this is a, the beginning of the construction document and almost in the nature and the virtue of the drawing itself, you see the two sort of, um, different morphologies of the project uh, uh, with, let's say, an architecture that happens exactly twice, here and there, it's exactly the same program, uh, but uh, has this kind of unique idea, so every framework, every expression of architecture is being done once, and here is this kind of super repetitive mode. And with this uh, juxtaposition, the building basically gets its own sense of morphology, its own sense of architectural expression. You see this in the long section, see how the staircase uh, are being organized here, and then these very modular 
uh, ceilings uh, that, does, that, that do not need any kind of foam work, but are uh, pre-casted and uh, prefabricated uh, inside. So this is a good example to show that we think the constraint can really deliver a very specific expression about the architecture without saying like, oh, I want to make a concrete building and it needs to be all the same quality or all with the same intensity. You can really moderate the difference uh, the different uh, qualities uh, of uh, intensities in your own architecture, and this maybe is uh, is the exciting part of, of it. Uh, this is a project which we have almost finished. Next Friday, uh, I'm going to inaugurate the building. Uh, we go to Berlin. The office has been uh, continuously engaged in Berlin. Um, this was lucky because we built 10 years ago the Heinrich Böll Foundation which was a kind of a, a building for a political institution. And from there, we, we, we somehow managed to have access to very particular competitions. And this one, which is the Tuts Media Building, the Tuts Media Building means it's, it's the leftish newspaper in Berlin. Yeah? It's the very leftish newspaper in Berlin. And the image that I show, this, uh, show here is uh, one of the early IBA projects uh, in Kreuzberg. This is a uh, um, Hadox project, uh, a fantastic his tower and two housing project. Actually, some of the most renowned architects in Berlin still lives uh, in it. Uh, it's a wonderful project. And our side is the right uh, opposite side. So you see here, uh, this, these are the EBA projects. You see the small uh, impact uh, of uh, the tower project of uh, John Haydock. You see this is the uh, ending of the Friedrichstraße. Now, if you go to Berlin as a tourist or a, as an architect, you, the Friedrichstraße, you don't build 10 times in your life. You know, this is like where Checkpoint Charlie is, 500 meters from Checkpoint Charlie. This is a kind of a road, this is so historically loaded, uh, of the Second World War, of the impact of the World War in the city and the division. You see Daniel Liebeskind Jewish Museum, um, you see this is the Jewish Academy, uh, and we are right next to these kind of um, uh, dissoluted, basically, uh, city body of uh, um, Friedrichstadt. So this was the site, this is Friedrichstraße. this was the site, and this is the client. And the client really is a freak show, it's a complete freak show, I've never seen so, so radical freaks like this. Um, um, uh, they uh, are very intelligent, uh, but they don't are very representative, which is very interesting, because it's up to us to find a, a, a representation for them. This was our site visit. The, the, the whole newspaper is a huge mess. I mean, really an incredible mess, like uh, although we do, everyone talks about the digital age, this is the reality. This is all paper and paper and paper. And we designed the network and we found it very, very intriguing that, let's say, the head of, of the newspaper said that although the newspaper has been spread around town all over and they wanted to reunify and, and condense all the activity in this new building, that they do not know how to work in 10 years from now. You know, so because if you look at the print media, if you look at what happens in media, every five years seem to be a complete breakthrough. Uh, if you think that the Olympic Games in 2016 in Switzerland were watched, 60% of the total audience watched the Olympic Games by mobile phone. Yeah? So you see that the, the whole industry is basically on the verge of getting something and no one really knows how or what really turns out. Now this was the framework for us and what we did is we designed a building that was restricted to the edge, you can say, that has a network on the facade and leaves enormous spans inside. This was the white model. So we wanted to design a building that the load bearing was stiffening out the entire building. So you would not uh, be obliged, you, you have no ob obligation to uh, introduce a core. So this was the structural model. So you had a kind of a dancing column 
um, and a, a kind of a diaphragma that basically performs as a total core and inside deep spans, 14 meter plus, um, a concrete work that is pre-stressed in Switzerland, we do this quite often, but in, the Germans had no clue about it. Uh, so it was a very uh, important uh, uh, conviction to do uh, so that they understand that with cables they can pre-stress and they can, they can increase the span and the slenderness of the construction. And this was our goal, you know, so building the frame of a huge mess, so to speak, because we had no hold on the inside. We had no idea how it's evolving, but really working on this expression of an architecture that finds a sense of order, but allows an, an enormous tolerance of disorder or participation or whatever. This, uh, they, this, now I'm going through a sequence of working models. You see like how this diaphragma of the structure and the balcony that is being mirrored produces this kind of moiré or this kind of complexity of the facade. This was a very exciting moment to see actually those um, uh, load-bearing columns uh, uh, being mounted on site. And this was a project and I said, it's so important to design this together with your structural engineer because you're depending not only on him, but you and him are basically like mutual, is, have a mutual consent or need a mutual consent on the development of this facade, of this technology in order to allow this. These, these are the drawings where you see the implementation of steel, the way that the columns take over the momentum, the horizontal forces of the entire building. So very particular, very, very special. This was the expression of the architecture, how it actually came together, slap and the column, um, uh, to use this kind of a st as a stiff knot uh, to, to, to hold the building. Uh. And this was the plan. And so we had four meter, 14 meter spans. There was a kind of a court that was designed or prescript, prescribed uh, by the uh, building code and, and, and a thinner area. And in the middle, um, um, all kinds of different meeting rooms. So you could basically organize all these areas the way uh, uh, you or they or someone else wanted it. And these are now very new images because uh, um, we just have sort of quitted the construction phase now. And you see how these deep spans, this kind of beam structure uh, roof with the pre-stressed condition in it, link to this uh, um, uh, column structure here that uh, stiffs out the entire building, this kind of um, genesis of inside and outside uh, in it, uh, this kind of very rare moment of a singular office that almost reminds us to some um, kind of very perceived Japanese uh, expression of architecture, but this happens rather uh, uh, accidentally. Uh, the way that the main entry is being organized with a very public ground, with restaurants, meeting rooms. And you see that the architecture is actually there, but it's not claiming. So the architecture is almost like an infrastructure. It, it kind of s surrounds, let's say, what is going to happen in the future. This is exactly what we're trying to do, to give them a podium or a platform, so to speak, in which they can evolve, uh, turn everything upside down. And the architecture is exactly this edge the frame, the, the end of the space uh, in order to, to support this uh, new media or the new age of media, some other expressions, the way we deal with, with technology or with supply and equipment. Um, it's an architecture that, that really uses this marginality uh, of, to exploit these, these moments and, and leave the rest really open. Some, other plans, and this is maybe a very interesting image. This is on, in the construction phase where you see these double diagonals, the, the, do, the double height spaces, the, the structural fortification here along, and um, the, the crisscrossing of the staircases. You see, it's a very, it's a, it's a very robust and a very tough expression of space that we think is very adequate for that uh, uh, idea of, or for that ambition of, of the newspaper. This is uh, like the workshop where they meet. Uh, um, so you see it's like a warehouse character, but it has this kind of very 
uh, seldom uh, uh, moments of re re refinement, the main entry with the, with the staircase going up, um, going through the facade that mirrors it and it's very, very a, a tough expression. It's galvanized, galvanized is also, the galvanization is also an expression of a tough, endurable surface and you see uh, how it's being ex expressed. So although the material is very tough, the making and the meeting is very fine. So this is a kind of a uh, moment uh, where uh, uh, the balcony comes together, how a knot is being expressed and the view, the, the, the expression of the finished building within the urban context uh, which you see here uh, along the Friedrichstraße. Now, uh, the, the Academia in Mendrisio is a very nice circumstance, a very nice context, uh, not only for teaching, but also, of course, for making a project. This was uh, our, this is basically the old hospital which become, became very early. The new architectural school founded by Mario Botta and Leo Galfetti, uh, which is in a way the only art school in Switzerland to design architecture and to study architecture. So it's, the rest has a kind of a more a technical curriculum. Um, and so it's a very bizarre and a very, very unique proposition in education to study architecture within this frame. Now, um, I'm shortly describing this. This is this Teatro de Architectura from, from Mario Botta, which, which is adjacent now to this old hospital, um, uh, the Torconi building, uh, and the new atelier should be expressed here uh, uh, at the north part. And uh, I'm showing this because we, we have done a whole sequence of buildings with these kind of pivoting relationships. And this is exactly the way how the northern expression has a geometry in the existence of the building. So it has a kind of an angled relation because it's exposed exactly to north. And it produced a kind of a narrowness which we were really interested in, in contrast to these uh, adjacent connections uh, of the existing building. So uh, it is a building that sort of tries to search for its proximity to others. And this was the kind of view uh, in it uh, or on it, uh, the way that the, the shed, the, the pitch roof uh, allows strictly northern light uh, to be entered. This is the white model where you see this, this geometry of a diagonal that actually works as a shed and directed to north. The structural device to make this in a very similar way as a framework for the entire uh, architecture to express walls, roofs, and sheds sort of as an architecture that encircles and encompasses um, the architecture of the young students uh, at the Academia uh, with the idea of uh, making an additional building for the campus, uh, a, a simple, quite archetypical but distorted uh, a building. This is the expression from the inside, both sides concrete with a double layered concrete. The reviewing area and these are maybe a small sequence to, to see how the, uh, the, the, the expression of, of concrete can adapt to this very colorful uh, South Ticino expression of architecture, very reddish, very warm, and how the architecture of the concrete, which here in that case will be pigmented or should be pigmented, uh, uh, can, can almost adapt or can encounter uh, the, 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 this proximity of the uh, Ticino architecture uh, nearby. I, I think that this, these pivots, uh, we, we have worked further and uh, it, uh, this is like a derivate, this is kind of a small project where a very good friend of us, an artist uh, that lives in the countryside and out of this, this uh, expression we designed this building for him, which is basically both a workshop and an art gallery. Um, and uh, it is basically one of these projects that uh, um, uh, deal with the shed idea uh, and uh, uh, tries basically to do only that one thing 
for for the for uh, um, a common interior space, and it's also a double-sided concrete project uh, uh, which we are now doing the building permit. Uh, it's really out uh, in in the countryside. It's very rare for us. We haven't really worked a lot on the countryside. We normally do more. The, uh, our work in cities and expression how the type of space is being organized like a sequence of pitches one half pitch one open space uh, pitch and then a, a total uh, um, a pitch roof where you see this is the the outdoor patio area this is the sequence about the area for dining and conferencing and uh, uh, discussions uh, the way that the the uh, gallery follows a bit the topography, uh, the kitchen area. So it's all under the same regime, but simply expresses it in a very sort of reduced way, in a very robust sense of architecture. And then uh, the sort of uh, enclosed uh, condition with the bathroom, the, the patio, and the overall in it. Now this is the last project, but it's also a very specific project, and it took us years uh, to build because uh, sometimes uh, things in Switzerland go really very slow due to a political process and um, the agreement of public means. This is a public school in one of the richest communities in Switzerland. And why building a public school in the richest community? Um, most of the kids here go to private school. I'm a kid of a public school. All, all my generation have attended to public schools in Switzerland. And all those that could not follow the public school went to private schools. And now things have changed. And you see like this is kind of almost a kind of Anglo-Saxon model that has been implemented in Switzerland that means like going to private school means like it's better than being at the public school. This is new to, to um, Switzerland. And this uh, community got so much money because the rich live here that they said, like, we need to re-evact, re-animate um, or uh, uh, reinvent, so to speak, our public school program. And this was a competition to make a public school more similar to, let's say, these case uh, didactics that the private schools are running to organize a new public school for two communities. That's in Switzerland super rare. You have to imagine like one community and another one puts the, me the money together to build one school. Normally the federative structure is like every community does its own thing. So this was a second uh, very complicated but a very um, uh, exciting way, for example, also to say we need to give the public school a new chance so to... to uh, uh, um, Reinitialize this idea that everyone uh, can access top uh, education. Now, this was the site, so the site was delicate, a beautiful landscape, and we designed a very compact cube that would not destroy the beautiful landscape. So, instead of a horizontal expression of the school, we t made a tower. Um, and uh, this was the early model so that most of the landscape could really survive and really work with this uh, uh, embeddening of the, of the cube. And this was our white model that uh, um, is the expression of the corridors. Um, in Switzerland, uh, the classroom was very much defined. It was always like 60, 78 square meter was a classroom. And the entire uh, corridor was always a kind of a buffer or an added value, or you, you needed to put some possibilities to teach in the corridor. Here, they, the, the model got completely reversed. The new program of this public school said, like, we want to have classrooms that are extremely flexible. So from 18 square meter to 78 square meters, or even to 150 square meter. Um, and what we did is we, we, we reversed the classical uh, relation, and we built the structure with the, with the corridors. And this is basically a structural model of the corridors, how the corridors 
corridors are expressed on every level. And this was the real structural model, and I hope, yes, there is the idea that on every level we turn the plan 90 degrees, and by doing that we get a structural concept of the building, and you see this in a very schematic expression, so by doing that on every level you have a beam, so to speak, to support the facade. And we did this because that would allow us, every time we have a classroom level, to uh, completely open the, this area. And this is uh, the close-up. You see here exactly the rotation angle where every time the space is rotated around 90 degrees. This was the ground level. This was the standard level, and now you see how it rotates on 90 degrees. So, of course, the corridor always stays, but the corridor rotates 90 degrees. And it kind of allowed us a kind of a very uh, performative load-bearing concept of the facade. And this was the early uh, uh, expression of the raw building. You see the beam structure. This is, I think, 28 meters of span. And uh, it is being basically carried by the corridor that is on top of it. And this was the engineering plan. You see how all the beam structures have been introduced to the cores. And then the core, uh, sorry, then the, the corridor on the next level goes across and holds basically this sagging, this, this bending of, the, of uh, the area. And the result was a kind of a classroom uh, section in these areas, these areas, or in these, where we, could, uh, where we could basically open everything to a studio, an atelier, or a group room, et cetera, et cetera. This is the section. This is the aisle. This is a transparent moment to, into the classrooms. This is this inner core that sort of stiffs out the entire building. This is the view through, which is all done in, in, in situ. And you see how the, the structural beams are basically um, uh, operating as a kind of idea of uh, to moderate the modularity, the moment to uh, enlarge the classrooms, to make it small. This is our first building in Switzerland that we built monolithically, like 1960. So we put the insulation inside, so it's not a double frame, so it's not a double skin, it's a singular skin. You can say what you, what you make with concrete is also what you see with concrete. And we simulated it completely through the building. So with the new possibilities of, um, of the physics and the simulation program, we could show that this was a, a, a feasible way. And this was the expression at the finished building. It's the title of the lecture. And last but not least, a small flyover so that you see, uh, let's say, what the impact of the concrete architecture is, that although it's very robust, that it produces a, a very high degree of sensuality and, uh, and uh, uh, a poetic moment. And this is how the idea, the strategy, and the context basically delivers an architecture that uh, could be very robust, but very fine. So you see this kind of grown context here. The tower, uh, these alternating floors between aisle and open span for classrooms. You see in afar the Lake of Zurich, the top level where you enter into the corridor, the, the cylindric staircase in the center that kind of uh, doubles or echoes, so to speak, the permanent rotation in the inner area. So every class on every level has a different orientation and different view, um, arriving basically at the landing uh, and also producing a kind of a, a view. Now you see to the outside, this is the main entry. This moment of transparency in the school that allows really to engage uh, classrooms in all directions. The, the robust expression of the corridors um, to be exploited. And the staircase basically that stays the kind of uh, knot or the core of the entire school um, and uh, is a kind of a point of orientation all across uh, the building. 
zooming out and you see how compact the building remains uh, and how, how diversified or how open the expression now of classrooms are. So from uh, very intimate conditions into expansive, so into uh, spaces that expand all across uh, and play this relation between niche and large spans uh, on the site. I think this should be about finished. So I thank you very much.